Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm John Kleinings, the Voluntary Services Director, and I have uh, Ron Mentor right here to my right, the Assistant Voluntary Services Director. First and foremost, we, we, we are very happy to see everybody in person. This is fantastic. That's great to renew our relationships and friendships with each and every one of you with what you do and your perspective of hospitals and facilities across the country. Uh, thank you for taking your time to come here this morning, bright and early, uh, and to listen to what we want, would like to talk with you about. Uh, we're gonna talk, most of this presentation is gonna be about the new uh, grant process for when you go to apply for your vehicles if you're looking to replace vehicles in your prospective facility. Um, it's a new process that the Charitable Service Trust is using to help simplify. So we're going to make our way through that and uh, we are going to do a webinar later on which is in one of these slides uh, as we get closer to the grant period. So you can come online and join us that way. We just did a webinar about a week and a half ago and uh, we noticed that uh, we maxed out uh, participation very quickly. And so we're gonna be redoing that webinar here real soon on a new platform via Zoom so we can increase the space and opportunities for people to participate. So if you, you had that interest about LVAP best practices, uh, please look at joining us at a later date. Um, here's some of our team members. Uh, I got my farmers only profile pick right up there, so does Ron. Um, obviously we're responsible for quite a bit of, of things at DAV, the transportation network, the youth scholarship program, uh, recognizing volunteers through the George Seal, George Seal Auxiliary uh, program, uh, our, our partnership with the VA as it relates to the Winter Sports Clinic, uh, partnership with the VA as it relates to the newly renamed National Disabled Veterans Golf Clinic, formerly known the T Tournament. And, I currently sit in the, as the chair of the National Executive Advisory Committee for the VA. Uh, my stint as the chair will end at the end of this year, um, but DAV will continue to be involved on the National Advisory Committee at that level. Uh, some of you uh, are, are friends of ours that are participating in that as well and are very active in the NAC, so thank you for your involvement there. Ron does all those same things as well. Uh, you see Katie Deschler. She's the Voluntary Services Supervisor. Um, a lot of you have had interaction with her uh, in relations to sponsorships uh, of our adaptive sports programs that we put on with the VA. Elise Donaldson, uh, she is my assistant, and she uh, is responsible for processing a, the scholarship payments to be made payable to financial institute or school institutions. All right, Andy. Good morning, hey, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll sing that young man happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Andy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Andy. Um, Elise processes our uh, payments to, to, to schools for our scholarship recipients. So, and uh, she, amongst other things, puts together our presentations and is uh, uh, very knowledgeable about all of the programs we have in voluntary services. Most of you are very familiar with the next person on the slide, Connie Kinney. Uh, Connie's primary responsibility is our transportation network. You'll have contact with her throughout the year. Um, and in relation to the tra uh, transportation network, uh, it's going to be a slow year. Uh, if you haven't been sleeping under a rock, you know that it's, you drive by a car lot, there's not very many new cars to choose from because of the chip superconductor type uh, shortage. Um, we did receive all of our Ford Explorers that were ordered this year and they're in our new location in Erlanger and you probably have made contact with Connie for working on getting those picked up. The Transits and Transit Connects, they haven't even started production on those yet. <clears throat> we hope to see them hopefully sometime in September, get them decaled as quick as possible and off the lot by the end of December. Um, let's see, Shelby Buckler. She's new to the team uh, since we've had our last convention in 2019. 
Um, Shelby's primary responsibility is the volunteerforveterans.org platform and focusing on the local veterans assistance program. Odie Hall. Odie Hall is uh, rec uh, responsible for certifying you as your VAVS rep or dep uh, in your facility and she takes your cap orders and gets those processed for you. I know we've had some problems with the cap orders and we work very closely with our procurement department to take care of that and get you fixed up as, for, as it relates to your caps. Pam Henning, uh, her primary responsibility and role is the hospital service coordinator directory and getting transportation network reports into our new CRM that uh, just went live six weeks ago. Tina Warndorf is a voluntary services specialist as well and she's responsible for inputting reports into our CRM to, in an effort to make sure we recognize everybody for their most precious time and that's your volunteering. Uh, so we appreciate you for that. The grant process. Um, Again, this is majority of the uh, presentation today. We'll hit some other stuff at the end. Uh, traditionally, we like to send out a letter in September, October after we receive pricing from Ford. It might be even later this year because of the shortage and how slow everything has been rolling with the auto industry. Uh, we'll get a memo out to you as soon as we receive pricing from Ford Motor Company and we receive our, our certified discounts uh, that we obtained prior to releasing that memo along with what vehicles and options will be available to you to choose. When you go to enroll into the smart, simple grant process, some of you may have already used it. It's been live for about three weeks. If you've filed for a grant for your HSC program, you've probably utilized this. If not, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna request a password. So you're going to uh, start building your quote unquote profile in this process. It has all your information in it. You're just gonna get your profile. And it's, it's typically gonna be the department adjutant and commander that are gonna start that process for you. Once you start looking for the funding opportunity down in the bottom right hand corner, that's what you're gonna be applying for. It's your opportunity to request assistance through the trust to assist you in purchasing new vehicles to replace your aging fleet. It's important that your finances as a department or a chapter be in order uh, to go through this. You're gonna get an eligibility question um, and this is very user friendly and in, in, in working with them to put this presentation together, I was very impressed with how easy it is to navigate through the process. If you skip a step, when you go to submit or go to the next page, it's gonna kindly remind you that you skipped that step. You're not gonna lose anything. You'll go back, fill in the blank, and be able to continue on with the process. Answer all the questions that are abstract and read. Obviously, that's important. Um, and your entire process should only take about 15, 10 to 15 minutes for each one of your funding requests. Here's where, as a department adjutant or department commander, you're going to be able to invite others to do this process for you. You can delegate to a chapter commander, a chapter adjutant, or somebody else, uh, and have them navigate the process. If we'll just say chapter uh, 20 out of Texas is applying for the transportation network grant, uh, the adjutant Teresa Jonakin can delegate that down to the chapter commander and once they get the information in the system they'll be notified that it's in there so they can go through and verify its accuracy before forwarding it on uh, for consideration and i'm not trying to bore you with reading all this i'm trying to hit the highlights so we have the opportunity to have any questions and answers at the end but we're going to make this presentation available to you on the members only portal at dav.org at this point in the process you'll start to uh request what type of vehicles you're wanting to purchase uh, to replace your aging fleet. And we'll have those, you know, typically we have three or four different models that you can choose from based on what Ford, Ford is making available for us to uh, allow you to place your order for. Uh, then you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have to put down separate entries, in, in, entries, excuse me, based on your vehicle type and vehicle location. So for every one of your locations and every one of your vehicle types, you're going to fill in this form multiple times. <laughs> I think the senior vice commander's next door. 
So here you go. You get to start dropping down and selecting the types of vehicles that you're looking for. And as you note in parentheses, you'll see it's populating the minimum share that's going to be required for you to, to put forth. You can put down the quantity of vehicles, the location, and if it's not going to be stationed at a facility, you know, a VA community-based outpatient clinic or a VA medical center specifically, in this particular instance, we put down we're parking in at my house. Um, probably not the safest place to park it, but we were going to park it there. Um, you'll, you'll put that uh, outside location, and those places are typically uh, city community centers or police departments or, or places that are very secure and you have a process in place. I know Louisiana parks some of theirs at uh, different police departments and they go in and drop the key off and pick it up in the morning. Um, and then you're going to, everything's going to have a drop down field. So again, it's extremely user friendly. Don't be nervous about the process. Um, and then the department's going to put the information in. Um, and if they're doing it on behalf of the chapter or doing it on behalf of the department, again, that's where the delegation process comes into place. And we picked on Oklahoma. I like to pick on Danny Oliver and their department. So uh, we did Shawnee Chapter 54 here, and we've continued on with uh, the information that's going to show you. You can't go wrong. can't put the wrong amount in here, okay? And then here on this, on this slide, or this portion of the grant process, you're able to select your shares. So if you have different funding entities, maybe it's the uh, Elks Lodge in your area and it's the DAV chapter and you have the local community Boy Scout group that wants to donate to this, you can break down all your funding sources throughout this process. And it'll hold on to that. So if you historically, if it's something that happens every year, or if you're receiving money from the state, to help do this, you can put this information in here and it'll make it easier as the years goes on. And we're gonna continue to do refreshers on this because once a year, we tend to forget exactly how the process works and we understand that. And we may make a, a, a training tool to help you navigate this process. Again, it tells you what the proposed share is and you're just gonna say, do you have this amount? put that amount in and you'll continue to drop down and put all those sources in. <clears throat> and once you get all said and done here, it's going to say, okay, here's your total amount and here's what you're asking for from the trust. Um, are you happy with this? You'll hit save or you can close and come back at a later date if you need to verify some more information. Once it's all said and done there, it'll break it down a little bit further for you. So you have an audit trail of everything that you've done throughout this process and you can go back and look at the end of submitting this, your pending request and where those vehicles are going to be assigned and exactly what you're looking for. Um, a lot of you know that when we receive the grant, the paper applications from you, there's some mathematical errors that are made on those or uh, you for, you, you didn't carry over your two of these vehicles and one of those, so we call you, verify, hey, just so you know, this is what we found, get your permission over the phone and go through that process. You're not going to run into those types of clerical errors that are common to happen because we're all human. We're going to make some of those mistakes with this process. Once you um, submit the request and you close it in the upper right hand corner by selecting the X, you can only and at that point, you're only going to make changes if there's revisions that need to take place. So you would go down to the bottom, click on the make a revision process or make a change process and go in and make any changes that need to be made. Then this will be on the main page and it will have, a, again, a breakdown of everything that, that you're looking to purchase uh, for the upcoming year. Once all this has been done, it's going to indicate that confirm that you have the funds available. Uh, a lot of times when you go through and put this in the system, it, currently you call and say, uh, hey John, uh, we fell a little bit short on our funding. We're not gonna be able to buy that vehicle. Fortunately, we've had departments in the past that have been standing by waiting for a vehicle. They came in, came in inherited some money, some shape, form or fashion, and were able to shift your, the purchase that you wanted to make to somebody else. Um, that we, we try to be very accommodating with everybody across uh, the country. I know a few of you have already hit me up and said you're ready to get a new vehicle, uh, so if somebody falls short to let them know. We keep a good running list and we go through that process quickly to, to make sure you have the need 
and we'll get the vehicle done. This right here, just answer the question honestly. If you don't have all the funding, click no. If you have it all, go ahead and mark yes. And here we go at the end. This is the certification form. This is, this is your quote unquote digital signature. This is where you'll submit that process or your application, excuse me. At the end of it, once it's all said and done, it'll show that you have one thing submitted. You can see my squiggly little blue circle there. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue to um, review that application to ensure everything is accurate, to ensure all your finances are in order, and to ensure that uh, you don't have some extra money in a budget that you can uh, pay a little bit more for. So the application process typically ends in November or December. Again, this is typical. And this is not a typical year with the auto industry. So we're going to remain fluid and flexible. Uh, we have, try to have all the applications reviewed and approved by January and February. Again, be, be, be flexible with us. And in late February, you get a nice little letter letting you know your grant process has been approved. We go ahead and order the vehicles. We then notify you to go ahead and ship your payment to us. You put your check in the mail, attention Connie Kenny, and we get it in the mail. We take it up to our finance and accounting department. They check you off this massive spreadsheet that we have and maintain. Once the vehicles are ordered again, we get the vehicles into our dealership and we have a great relationship with a decal company or graphics company. They get those vehicles decaled as quick as possible. Uh, for, for those of you who have been our headquarters uh, in the past, you know that we used to do our graphics in our, in our facility. Well, we found a new efficiency and we sent them directly over to our uh, graphic installer and we get 10 or 12 vehicles a week versus two, three vehicles a week done. So we've really streamlined that process. So as soon as the vehicles roll on the lot, they're ready to be picked up. They typically come in late spring through early summer. And again, not a typical year. I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm getting a lot of phone calls from everybody wanting to know if their vehicle's ready yet. Once those vehicles are ready, we email you a letter, let you know that they're ready for pickup. You need to work closely with your VA medical facility uh, to coordinate that pickup. We'd love to see our volunteers come into the facility, get a tour of our brand new headquarters. Um, pick up the vehicle and make their trip back. It's, it's a reward for all your selfless time that you're donating in your facilities. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't make sense, and the VA hospitals suggest getting it shipped out, that's great too. It saves miles on the vehicle. It gives the vehicle a longer lifespan when it gets to your location. So we don't expect folks from Tucson to drive out and pick up a vehicle from Cincinnati, Ohio, and drive back to Tucson or Seattle for that matter. Uh, get a freighter out there, we'll get them loaded up and get them out to you. They're gonna show up, be ready for use when they get there, okay? Then we get a lot of calls and questions about, how do I get my vehicle back? And we got a vehicle sitting on so-and-so's, uh, you know, at this facility, it's been sitting there for quite some time. 1620.02 really points that out. If you have any problems with that, and I know you do, and that's okay. Uh, Connie Kenny and I and Ron, we've all worked very closely with VA Central Office. We have a great relationship with them and we're typically able to get you your titles back uh, real quick. I did get hit up while we were here about an issue for vehicles that they've been struggling for a year. I've asked that individual to email me the year, make, model, and VIN number and where that vehicle is stationed so we can work on getting that stuff done. Don't ever hesitate to pick up the phone, give Ron or I a call. Give Connie a call. That's what we're there for. We'll help you get your vehicle stuff taken care of, okay? Again, this just kind of outlines the process. Most of you are very familiar with it. You know, you're the original donor. You get the vehicle back. Um, if you're not going to utilize the vehicle for a chapter purpose or an intended DAB purpose, and you're going to sell the vehicle privately, you're required to remove the decals. We had an incident a few years ago where a vehicle was sold and it was sold to a private guy. He's riding around town with a DAV wrapped vehicle and he decides he wants to drive through the zoo, do a hit and run. Fortunately for the giraffe, no, I'm just joking. Uh, uh, fortunately, there was not a lot of damage done and the zoo was very forgiving because of DAV and our charity. Um, however, you know, it's important that you protect our brand. You protected the, the uh, integrity of this organization. So when you get a vehicle back, if you're gonna sell it to the private sector, 
take the time and have the graphics removed. If you're gonna keep it as a chapter and utilize it in your community, feel free to keep that stuff on there. It's a great advertisement for what we do. Now, if you're wanting to get some graphics reinstalled or, or done, or you had a vehicle that was damaged, advertising vehicles is our go-to organization or company. Uh, they have all the appropriate color graphics. They do all of our work for us. If you had a vehicle that the hood needs to be replaced or the fender was damaged and you need a new graphic, again, all we need is the year, make, model, and VIN number of that vehicle. They'll print the graphic out, mail it to the hospital, and get it installed. Again, there's a cost associated with that. It's not free. But again, it, it really keeps us consistent in our imagery and our messaging. So don't hesitate to reach out to us again. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to help you keep uh, vehicles looking tip top. And uh, we know some, some areas like Tucson, Phoenix, uh, where the sun is beating down on those vehicles. Uh, we, we only see a lifespan of a couple years. Um, some areas such as Wisconsin, where it's really cold and they run the vehicles in the morning to warm them up. Same thing, we only see the graphics last a couple of years. Unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with. And that's, that's uncontrollable. Uh, but do your best to, to care for the vehicle and keep it in tip top shape for us. If you have an accident, in these vehicles. Uh, we want to know about it. Uh, we want to know everybody's okay and that's the calls we like to hear that everybody's fine, nobody was hurt, a little bit of damage to the vehicle um, and we get those calls too that it was a tragedy um, and it's important that we know about that. Uh, we can, can start preparing and helping you guys if you get phone calls uh, as leaders in your community for DAV uh, to be prepared to answer questions or you can always refer them to Ron or myself and we'll be able to help um, work that process out, okay? To Ron's point, the sooner the better. Uh, we had an accident in Las Vegas a few years ago and the day it happened, we got a phone call. That's, that's ideal. Our first question is going to be, is everybody okay? Um, that's the most important to us. Uh, oftentimes not. That's not the uh, information we receive. So please let us know as soon as possible if there's an accident in the vehicle. Monthly reporting. Um, obviously we've made our way through the grant process and talk a little bit about returning of vehicles, but monthly reporting forms, uh, these have changed uh, in more recent uh, months because we just rolled out a new CRM internally in DAV. And we've made huge improvements as an organization over time. This CRM has every program in DAV working out of one bucket. In the past, we've worked out at five or six, maybe even 10 different buckets. Uh, the reason we have this form set up the way it is, it's easy for us to import it into our CRM. Code has been written. We received this form back from you guys in a form of an Excel spreadsheet. We check it verify everything is accurate because sometimes there's an obvious mistake on there like I got 700 hours in a month of volunteering a little more than 700 hours in them you know doesn't look right to us so we'll verify that information with you once it's all said and done we import it in for processing literally takes seconds um, we import those overnight and everything gets updated that evening and you as a volunteer are recognized for your times and effort um, there's three different forms, the Form 40, the Form 50, and the Form 60. That's the HSC, the ABS, and our LVAP form. And again, links are in this uh, presentation that will be on the members only portal. Feel free to load them, uh, pull them down. Some of you have a problem navigating the spreadsheet or it's a little difficult. We understand that and we'll work flexibly with you to, to figure it out. But this makes our chance for errors very minimal. That's what we're trying to, to, to curb. So here's some of our upcoming webinars that we have coming up. Uh, again, like I said earlier, we're going to do a, the LVAP best practices again. Uh, we did find a better platform and we're looking forward to using it. We just want to test it out to make sure it works like it's intended. Um, but we have, we, we plan these out throughout the year. So the 19th at 2 and we try to do a 2 o'clock so that gets our friends in Hawaii the ability to join at, uh, I think it's 9 o'clock in the morning their time. Uh, so everybody has the opportunity to participate. Um, any questions or concerns, you can always contact us in these three ways. Email us at VABS at DAB.org. It's pretty easy to remember. Uh, when it comes in, all of our team members have access to that email box. You should be receiving a response within 24 hours. 
Uh, sometimes it might take a little bit more than that because we're traveling or doing something else as we continue to open back up as a country and get the ability to get back out and about. Shoot us, a, write us a letter if you like. We still get snail mail. It's really cool too. I, we love getting the thank you letters from our volunteers, thanking us for receiving their incentives or telling me don't send me this stuff anymore. That's not why I do it. Or mad because we took away the pen program. We did bring it back, so you should be getting your pens. Um, so we're trying to help you every way we can. Or by all means, pick up the phone, give us a call. Um, I'll give you my direct line right now if you like it. It's 859-442-2056. Um, I do answer my phone and I do return voicemails. So uh, some of you could probably relate to that. I've talked to you recently and you can attest to receiving a phone call back from us. Please note the new address. Eight, I'm sure, absolutely. It's 859-442-2056. You're welcome. And before I change, note the new address. 860 Dolwick Drive, Erlanger, Kentucky, 41018. I know for a lot of you that 3725 Alexandria Pike address is beaten to your head. Uh, we'll, we'll still get that, if, that mail to us, but a little easier if you get the new address, okay? Hang on one second. And the last thing I'd like to, like to say, and if you could come up here to the microphone, Paul, if you come up to the microphone, that'd be great. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say is I want to applaud each and every one of you for the Jesse Brown Memorial Youth Scholarship success. This year, we received nearly 80 nominations, 8-0, 80. Um, and I'd like to uh, personally thank Ron and uh, the DAV communications team for improving the electronic user experience for that. Um, they did a great job. They spent a lot of time working on that. Yeah, through COVID-19 and all everything that we had going on in our country, we received nearly 80 outstanding nominations for young men and women uh, volunteering on behalf of DAV. Please keep spreading the word, davscholarships.org, and encouraging young men and women to apply for that. All they have to hit is 100 hours in their lifetime before they age out, so to speak. Uh, and we continue to send, uh, Ron, I'm not gonna steal his credit, this is Ron's uh, thing. Ron sends out letters to you that says, hey, in our, according to our system, you have this many young men and women that are eligible. Call them, let them know the process is open, and encourage them to apply for the scholarship. Go ahead, buddy. Sorry about that. That's all right. Two quick questions. One, is the post office box at headquarters, are we no longer using that now? Yes, they still use the same P.O. box out of the Cincinnati area. Okay, second question with the credit process. Under the old style, the commander and the adjutant have to sign for the department. Is it just going to be one signature now? It, it's a digital signature, yes. That's my understanding in talking with the trust. It will just be the digital submission after you guys approved it. Even after you delegate it, it'll come back to you for approval. I'm gonna say it's gonna be two. Both of you are gonna submit the process. I could be wrong about that and I'll verify that information. We'll make sure it's accurate in our September webinar. All right, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate what you do. Yes, could you please step over to a microphone just so everybody has the opportunity to hear your question? Okay, thank you. We appreciate that. Was it would you step back there for a second and just entertain my question to you? Did you find it to be a very simple process and pretty much impossible to make a mistake on? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So again, you, you all should be, you're in for a treat. This is a really neat process. Uh, and just think of how much we've evolved as an organization over the last decade. Hey, Robert, how are you this morning? Where are my guys? If we delegate the uh, badge coordinators as uh, individuals who can request standards, does that give them the authority or do they go through the funding process as well or does that come back to the department in 
it will come back to the department to verify that. It, it's just an effort to make it, if you want to send it to the quote unquote resident expert, that's just the easiest way to do it, okay? Thanks, Robert. If you have any questions, please step up to a microphone. Us, we'll, we'll get through that. Yes, you can split the funding sources. There's multiple opportunities there. So it, it'll be back up to your department to work all that out and for the chapters to work it out. And it, it, nothing will change with that. So it'll be a very, should be very easy for you to, there. Makes sense. Thank you. Yes, sir. His question is about insurance on the vehicles. When you get the, when we get the vehicle, we donate it to the VA. The VA self insures that, so it's on the VA's responsibility, and then that's for them to go to the individual who T-boned them and work that out with their in, that person who T-boned them's insurance. Uh, we're not going to insure a policy for that. Yes, when we donate the vehicle, that's that's part of our agreement. Yeah, I, I, that was one of my slides. We'll we, reach out to me and Connie Kenny, and we'll help you get your titles back. We have a direct contact. We're able we're able to turn those around typically in like an hour. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I don't want to dictate how your chapter or your department runs your program or what you do. You will have the link for those spreadsheets here and you, you work it out with the department and you do it the way that you best see fit. No, we, we, all of, we have all of the forms, the VAVS forms, the LVAT form, your HSC form, your transport, it's all there. So I don't care how you do it, but that's up to the department I, or, or the chapter, however your department is structured. We just want to get the report so we can recognize the volunteers. I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. I don't care as long as we get the hours. I, but again, you need to work that out with your department. I'm not, I don't dictate how the department runs. We're just trying to put together a best practices what makes it, what makes it work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, the delay in chips does is going to affect this current year's vehicles. I don't know what it looks like for 2022. Uh, we'll probably know that later this year. Uh, well, then you know more than I know. I hadn't read the news this morning yet. So, uh, but I, I, I wait to hear from Ford. I get the update direct from the manufacturer. Um, and we are one of their longest standing partners 
customers, so to speak. Um, and I know we're able to get stuff done expeditiously, relatively speaking, right? Um, I do see it impacting us for a while. That's why I said we must remain fluid. Uh, yeah, the, typically the grant process will roll out in October or November of the year. We try to have a decision by December, January, and then we order our vehicles in February. Thank you. Yes. We typically do not order a vehicle with an automatic start. We try to find something that fits the ticket across the country. Um, we get a lot of requests for a lot of things, and I, and I respect those requests, but financially it just it, it becomes a burden, and we try to keep the cost as minimal as possible, as you can see by the share breakdown. So if, as a department, y'all chose to do that and the VA is willing to allow you to have that installed, that's on you. Um, but we're not going to look at doing something like that until it becomes a standard on vehicles. The second question is, is this is campers for mm -hmm. some smaller campers. Um, you know, we all know that for the VA, they say that they must be able to get in and out of the vehicle by themselves. But I know for at least 2019, uh, for Transit and Connect, there's no campers. So is that something we're going to be able to see more standardized with the board? I, I, I take those concerns and those complaints every year back to Ford and if it, like when the transit first came out it was a problem and then the transit they fixed it the following year I'm hoping to see this year that it's been resolved uh, if not you can just talk with your fleet manager at the facility a lot of times they're willing to take it out in town and have something installed because the cost is minimal keep in mind you just donated a thirty thousand dollar vehicle to the hospital they're not too upset about spending a couple hundred bucks usually to install that. But I do pass those concerns along. So I love it when people tell me about that. We work to get that rectified with the manufacturer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bob Jensen, Department of South Carolina, LVAP board there. I have a question about the number of hours that we can uh, put on the LVAP forms per, per month. Um, <laughs> I love this question. Um, uh, as far as uh, uh, together, why are we doing this uh, cafe out of the day? Well, uh, jokingly here, I prefer no more than 24 hours in a day for, for, for that. <laughs> Tip, I, would, I would say it should not exceed eight hours. The caregiver has to rest. Uh, I, I know, and I'm not taking away from that. It should not exceed more than eight hours a day. Well, I mean, a caregiver has to, they, they sleep. They're not always, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive of this, okay? I, even if you were to pay somebody to come in, they're not getting paid for 24 hours in a day. So, I, I understand that. So I, I would say eight to 10 hours a day, okay? I'll, I'll give a little bit of flexibility there. Ron, do you have any comments about that? Just being reasonable. Though. We're just trying to be reasonable, respectable. You just, you, you know, you got, you got to kind of understand where we're coming from, right? So be reasonable. Eight to 10 hours, does that sound fair to you? So, so what Ron's talking about up here, obviously we try to collaborate on these things. You would be surprised that we get reports, when I said jokingly more than 20 hours in a day, we get reports like that every day where people say that they did 900 hours in a month or 1,000 hours in a month. It's impossible. So be reasonable with what comes on there. And, and I mean, we, we, we want to do everything we can to recognize you for taking the time to submit it, for taking the time to do it, but it needs to be fair, okay? And I don't think that's unreasonable. 
Thank you. Yes, sir. Tom Lawton from the Department of Maryland. We have two vans that were in an accident that are being held at the current point, which is VA. And they were in turn to the hospital because we were planning to have to donate their two vans to the press because we're going to open up a parish shop in the year. And or if that doesn't happen, can we put them into the I don't have a problem with that. Either way. Either way, as long as the graphics are removed, if it's going to be donated. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I would just say under the other tab or whatever you think more closely uh, demonstrates yeah, the activity. Deb, we'll go back and take a look at that. It's a good question. We'll make sure we try to find a spot. Uh, Ron, write that down. We'll send you an email, Deb. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put a link on our next webinar that we do, or we'll talk about that then, okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying, you know, eight hours, the mic worker is trying to listen, you know, Washington State around the desert somewhere, but not in Philadelphia. I understand. I appreciate what you do. Keep up the good work. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello there, Mr. Pedro. I'm the Great State of New York. I'm the Department of Treasurer. And since this is a new position, Are you paid by the department? So that's not volunteering. So you're being compensated for your work. Well, when you're in this seminar, I'd say you could get an hour out of it. And every other seminar you go to, as long as you take that information back and share it, I don't have a problem with that. But I think you're being compensated, so there's no volunteering there. It's not very much. It's still compensation. <laughs> I appreciate the question. If you're vol if you're not being paid and you're volunteering, we'll take those volunteer hours. Yes, sir.
traditionally the VA is not going to come after somebody for volunteering their time. Um, I, I don't know of anybody, do you know of anybody that's been reduced for volunteering for VA compensation? Okay, uh, so I'll tell you what, I, we'll talk offline about that, okay? All right, thank you. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out this morning. Thank you for the great questions and answers, and thank you for your attention to what we have going on. Uh, we hope you enjoy the remainder of the convention. Again, it's great to see everybody. Uh, keep up the great work with everything you're doing. Uh, you have a great day, everyone. Thank you.